Hello. Rabbi. Oh, you're muted still. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you're muted. Are you done eating? Get out of here. Pause. Oh, I'm muted. I'm not <laughs> muted now. Yeah. How I'm was your day? Beautiful day. Beautiful day. Okay. Yeah, good. Take some medicine, somebody else. I'm glad you had a good day. <sighs> It's always a good day. Study the ways of God, it's always good, huh? <laughs> so we're on page 179 here. I'm going to go look at uh, the tefillin. My rabbi's giving a lecture Wednesday on it. So I'm going to go start with tefillin here and try to add to what he had next week on Wednesday night when he has his class at Pine. Um, <laughs> So he says it's going to be a mind blowing class. So I oh, really? <laughs> hang on to my hat. <laughs> hang on to my hat for Wednesday's class. So yeah, so I'll let you know uh, next week what he You'll talks about. You'll have to take a towel and That's tie it around your head. I'll have to see what's mind blowing. If he said, if Ariel says it's mind blowing, I believe it. <laughs> so on, on 11A, on page 179, we're talking about uh, women. First of all, women aren't obligated to wear tefillin. So when, when the wife of the prophet Ezekiel died, God told him, God said, don't practice. I, I can't believe he said not to observe practice in the morning. He was commanded, like he was commanded to wear tefillin from this, the Gemara and Moed Katan derives the mourners are forbidden to wear tefillin. Yeah. So what does that mean here? Uh, Moed Katan uh, about this prohibition. Please. So where does he get this from? Uh, he said the following in the name of a mourner is obligated in all the mitzvot. So this is the great Rabbi Abba except for the mitzvah of tefillin. So you could do all the things in the Torah if you're a mourner, but you can't do tefillin because the word glory is said about tefillin as the verse says, fix upon yourself your glory. So Ezekiel 20, so what does it mean? So it's not fitting that something described as glory be worn on the head of a mourner, which is soiled with the dust of mourning. Now, um, not everyone believes in this, um, about not wearing tefillin, um, mourners. So, depends on where you come from. When my father died, I didn't wear the tefillin at the minion, um, but, uh, my brother did. Okay. I remember they asked me, my brother's friends, why aren't you wearing tefillin? I said, well, that's just a Kabbalistic view. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't wear tefillin. I derive it from this sentence here. This is the teaches the Kornet Be'i Shammai, the words, and when you lie down, when you rise, teaches that in the evening that you have to lie down when you're reciting the Shema, and in the morning, you stand up. Beit Hillel says, and a person may say the Shema, whatever he said, whatever position you want, lying, walking, the Gemara sets a bright set to discuss it this week. So this whole thing starts back in Brachot when we studied this 15 years ago about lying down and rising up. So the rabbis taught, Beis Hill says the Shema may be said while one is standing and it can be recited by, while sitting. It may be recited while lying down and it may be recited while going on the road. So it's preferable, it says on 180, for someone who is walking to stop and stand in his place when saying the first verse of the Shema. 
uh, for its difficult concert while walking. Okay, so you don't want to be walking along like Shema Yisrael. I, I mean, I don't think that's the right reverence. Uh, and and it may even be recited while one is doing work. So there's exceptions to this in the Talmud. There is no obligation to say Shema in any specific position. There was once an incident. However, there was a Misa, as they say in Yiddish, where Rabbi Yishma was lying down. Elazar ben Azariah was standing. When it came time to recite the evening Shema, Rabbi Elazar lay down. Following, he said, I'm going according to Beit Shaman. Rabbi Shmuel stood. He wrecked. Rabbi Elazar said to Shmuel, my brother, I will make an analogy to which the matter may be compared. It's comparable to someone to whom someone people say in praise. Your beard is beautifully full, to which he replies in spite. Let it then be given over to the destroyers. That is, to who, who are the destroyers of it? The razor and the scissors. Since you have praised the beard, then I'm cutting it off. <laughs> That's a weird thing. You say it's good, I'm cutting it. So too, you have, so too have you done. Well, I was erect, you were lying down. But now that I've laid down, you may have stood erect. When I paid you the compliment of doing as you were doing, you change your position. Rav Ishmael said to him, by, by standing erect, follow the opinion of Hillel, which is accepted as the halacha. But you, by lying down, following Shammai, it is rejected. Remember, most cases, it was always according to Hillel. Moreover, I feared that the students might see us both lying down and might on that basis establish Beit Shammai's ruling as the halacha. So he said, I therefore stood, so that they should not make this mistake. So anyway, uh, there's different ways of doing it. Um, you can, whatever I think is best for you. Because the Mishnah says that in the morning, two blessings are said before the Shema and one after it. And in the evening, two blessings are said before the Shema and two after it. Um, so the Gemara is saying, so what, what blessings are said before the Shema? Um, so what, so we, when, we, when we first get up in the morning before the Shema, so what's the first thing that we say? Who forms light and creates darkness? The wording of the blessing is difficult. Darkness implies suffering, right? Because it says in Tehillim 107.10, the Lord says, why do you not say instead who forms light and creates twilight? It appear more proper to praise God with the word uh, twilight instead of Hosha. So that's his opinion. So the word nega refers to the half-light of twilight or dawn when the light is mixed with darkness. And another explanation uh, is therefore used frequently for darkness or night. Um, so the Gemara is answering on the next page, 181. We say, as it is written in the verse, so they're saying a verse from Yeshaya. It says, who forms light and creates darkness, who makes peace and creates evil. I am Hashem who makes all these. So saying I'm getting I'm getting the the prayer is right here from, from a verse that's right in the prophet Isaiah, the Gemara is saying. So the Gemara is asking, but according to this, that the wording of the blessing follows the wording of the verse, when the verse continues and says, Who makes peace and creates evil? Do we say that part of the blessing as is written in the verse? No, we don't. Rather we say, Who makes peace and creates evil? Shalom But we say who makes peace creates everything. That's changing the wording of the verse. We avoid mentioning. So what is he saying? We don't want to mention creation of evil, right? We don't want to, No, that evil is a four-letter word. <laughs> but we want to speak in terms of God creating everything, including evil, in order to use refined speech. Just as we are careful not to say evil here, too, we should say twilight in order to, to use refined speech. So it's just a matter of semantics. The Gemara is saying, rather, Rava said, we use the word dark instead of twilight. Why? So we can specifically mention the characteristics of the day, light during the night, and the characteristics of night, darkness during the day. So the word noga is often used figuratively for the darkness. Nonetheless, it also means light. So it could mean either thing. The Gemara is asking, now with regard to the characteristic of night during the day, as well, in fact, uh, we mentioned it, then when we say in the first blessing, who forms light and creates darkness. But regarding to mention the characteristic of day during the night, 
where it's found that we do this. Abai says we do it in the first blessing of the evening. So we're not doing it in Shachari. In the morning, we're doing it in the evening. Remember we say who removes light from the darkness and darkness from light. We thus mentioned the daytime characteristic of light by night. So Rabbi Yonah writes, the reason we mention the characteristics of night during the day and that of day during the night is to reject the claim of those who believe. So he's saying there's a reason. Because there are certain people in the world back then that believed that there are two gods, right? There's one God, there's a God who creates light, the other God creates darkness. So that's why they do this. We therefore carefully always mention the characteristics of night during the day and of day during the night to emphasize that there's only one God. So that's the crux, that's the crux of it, is that our prayers, we want to show that we're praying to one God, not two, who brought everything into being and who rules every aspect of creation. Does that make sense? That you might think that there might be two gods, and 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 the crux of our prayers is, Israel, Hashem Echad, that we have to always emphasize that God is one. We never want to give the appearance that God is two. So here's the insight: day and night. Does anyone want to read the insight? A Day and night are going back to the evening. I will. 181 to 182. On the bottom, inside A. Day and night. I think that's a famous song, actually. Frank Sinatra, In his right? commentary. <laughs> yeah, right. In his commentary to the first blessing of the Ma'arif prayer, R. Samson Raphael Hirsch echoes the thoughts presented in note four. This blessing refutes one of the oldest uh, fallacies to be devised by human thought, namely that the contrasts found in the phenomena of nature indicate the existence of more than one deity. That is, two separate and opposing divinities, a god of day, life, and prosperity on the one hand, and a god of night, death, evil, on the other. Our blessings take a stand against this view by avowing that the light, that light and darkness were created by the one and only God, solely to advance one and the same purpose, the welfare of both man and nature. It is this divine province that shapes this world of apparently conflicting phenomena into a unified world of perfect harmony. Therefore, when we recite this blessing in the morning, we add that God, who made light, is also the creator of darkness. And when we say it in the evening, we remember that the same God who created night is also the maker of the light of day. In this context, it's certainly no accident that we declare near the end of the blessing that Hashem's name is Hashem name is Lord of hosts. When applying the special name to the creator and master of the world, we conceive of the infinite variety of contrasting forces and competing creatures in the world as a as a great host of entities that submits itself to the will of a leader who commands the spiritual and bodily forces of those that have joined the host. It is precise, precisely the intelligence, the mind and the will of the leader that makes the multitude of unlike and unfriendly creatures, which would otherwise descend into confusion and chaos into a unified and orderly host. Uh, taking a different approach, Maharal, uh, makes the point that uh, that mention mentions the day and the night separately would be inappropriate because they are not really separate entities. They are both parts of a complete 24-hour day, as it is written. And was uh, and it was evening and it was morning, one day. Each component by itself, it's half of a whole, and is disrespectful to praise Hashem for creating parts of things rather than for creating the whole. Okay, so nighttime is, is God's attribute of strict judgment, while daylight is compassion. These aspects must be balanced, just as it's not possible for the world to exist with strict judgment alone, so too it cannot be functionally on attribute of compassion. So, you know what, basically it's one thing, right? Night and day, day and night, it's all a whole thing. Does that make sense? That night and day are just aspects of the four-hour day. Some of it's night, and some of it is daylight. And nighttime is a time for judgment. And morning time 
is a time of compassion. So that's just the way it is. So we don't want to confuse in the blessings that uh, that that there's two gods. It's all one thing, and God's a whole thing. And night and day, all components of a 24-hour day. Some of it's dark, some of it is night. But by ever by Boker Yom Rishon, as he said at the beginning when God created the world. Well, he just muted himself. You're right. You're muted, Rabbi. Oh, sorry. When I saw how many people there were here, it muted me. It's going. Okay, so the the study today will uh, be in, in memory of your niece, uh, Arlene. Since it's still a uh, time of mourning. And, Thank you very uh, much, Rabbi. We'll we'll learn to elevate our soul to the highest level of heaven through the study that we do, through the prayers that we do, and the giving of charities that we do in her name. Is there a charity uh, in her name that was established? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, Dana Farber Cancer Institute and uh, Brigham Women's Hospital. Oh, okay. did a, a wonderful job all around with with uh, Elizabeth and with her family. It, it was um, they're in, they're a wonderful hospital. Dana Farber and also Brigham. Yes, that's good to hear. You know what? <clears throat> I just lost a friend of mine also right after Elizabeth passed away. Our friend Sharona, who's in Kelohena, we do every every week so she passed away on shabbos so it's been, it's been a rough week for, for everyone here so i'm losing so many friends this year it's the third one already this year alone and they're all 68 darling so <laughs> i know elizabeth only lived to be 47. yeah and eight years of the shabira so it was tough yeah it's it's um I, you know it's the age it's the age we are it's the age i am is that there's always someone you know very frequently there's someone you know who's passed away it may not be your best buddy but you knew them well you talked with them you know uh well, it's a, it's a I, hard time I, I was looking at the i was looking at the internet yesterday and i was looking at espn and it said the chairman of espn uh in his 40s he just he went in he had a, a little medical condition. They just dropped dead in the hospital. So. Yeah. Doesn't go into details, but that's why, Ollie, that's why I look at life the way it is. You got to do as much as you can in one day. Right. Because yeah. You, yeah. you don't know what and you do. And he I does. I was just going to say. You never know. You never know when the last day is going to be in life. So got to do as much as we can in one day. Keep putting things off and putting things off. And like, I'm going to call someone. I'm going to call my friend. If I didn't call her, you know, I did speak yeah. to her before she died. Actually, I tried to reach her that day before, but her husband said she was already out of it and she wasn't able to talk, but at least he could relay a uh, message to her. I think we have to cherish every day and even days that in your heart aren't the brightest. You still need to go out and do things and do good things. You, you're not forgetting um, or disrespecting the person, but life was made to live and to carry on. And you know, you said something which I wrote down, Rabbi. Mm. I have it right here. Um, and you said it, I think, right the week the week before Elizabeth passed away. And um, you've said a lot of great things, but this is one of the most, this is one of the best things I've ever heard you say. And I'm paraphrasing, but basically okay. you said, the brevity of someone's life does not diminish their impact on our lives and how they shaped our lives. We have to reach back into the past to bring forward that, um, those memories. Yeah. 
and I and it ap certainly applies to Elizabeth. Uh, it's, it's it's a time to do things better, and and more and more I I I think you know a, any death is sad. A young death is tragic, but when someone dies in Judaism, and I think really anyone, you, you do good things. You remember them, you do good things, you do go out, you do more good deeds. And, and it's the only thing that makes sense to me in a way of when someone passes away. So yeah. I, I think instead, it's hard not to feel bad and not to be glum and you should feel bad, but it shouldn't stop us from going out and doing good works. Yeah, those were great I, I words. Got, Rabbi. Great words. I got, thank you. I just got. I was looking at my emails before, and I got one from the Young Israel of uh, West Hartford, and it turns out someone in their thirties just passed away uh, yeah. suddenly. Yeah. And uh, you know, when it's a child, I see, you know, got to be there for the parents, and yeah. uh, it's, you know, you never know in life. I mean, that was that was kind of shocking. All of a sudden, someone in their thirties just drops dead. Yeah. So, uh, well, that, back to the point, Arlene, that you really have to make the most of every day. There's, yeah. there's no, nothing is ever promised for the future. So if you want to keep putting things off, putting things off, putting things off, you really got to, I mean, writing a will for me was a big thing. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, mo and then Mel was there for me to help me, you know, make sure yeah. everything's okay. Just want to make sure, you know, everything's right. You know, all the thing, power of attorney, all that, all, you, yeah. know, I, you know, a lot of people might put it off. They say, I don't need it now. I don't need it now. But you know what? I've seen a lot of cases. People my age was a mess with their estate and all that because they didn't have any, there wasn't any will. Yep. Right. And things happen that you don't want to happen because you didn't say what you, excuse me, you didn't say what you wanted to happen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, when they that incident recently with someone, you know, they didn't they didn't know what the kids didn't know what the mother wanted is because the mother never told them about it. They, right. they didn't assume they were going to die and they so young. Yeah. But um, um, I, I think I think that all you guys are like a blessing to me. Uh, it's just I think each person is a separate blessing in the life of this community. Uh, I always tell people, they say, oh, where do you live? So, well, what's up there? <laughs> There's a Jewish community there? <laughs> yeah, there is a Jewish community here. And uh, not everyone knows there is a Jewish community here. It's small, but I I'm glad we're active. It, it may be small, but we we're active, right? I mean, after all, what do we have going on this week? I mean, I mean, we could, I'm going to talk about this at eight o'clock, but I mean, as far as going to study, we have today, 6, 6.30, 8 o'clock, Wednesday, 2.30, 3, 3.30, Friday night service with Torah study, you know, uh, Saturday morning study with Torah study. We have the men's club first Thursday. We have the women's club third Thursday. Uh, we had my birthday this week. We have the barbecue Yay. 23rd. Hmm? Yay. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, and then we have my cousin Robbie's coming on on August first uh, on Tuesday to to speak to us. Um, so I just think it's important. I mean, a lot of times when I first got here, people said, "You know what? Don't have so many minions. People don't want to be obligated. Don't give too many classes. No one's going to be interested." You know what? I understand about the minions, and you know I, I've understood that uh, over time. Uh, but the classes is one thing. To say that you know back in '95 that we don't need classes, that it, that people have enough with two services, to me, I don't. What do you guys think? I think that statement is something that we really have to challenge. I think the classes that we have, the six classes we have a week, we can even have more. We're going to have a meditation before Shabbat services. On the first Friday in August, we're going to begin then. Uh, I know Marty's a big believer in this. I think no matter, Marty and I grew up going to yeshiva. Okay, a little bit more of an advantage than everyone else here. 
we studied a lot. And I went to high school, studied in college, in yeshiva, in Israel. But I got to tell you, no matter how much I know, I look sometimes <laughs> just to see what's going on. And I say, the more I know, the more I don't know. I mean, my <laughs> rabbi gave a class on Sunday night. I said, wow, it's incredible. And now on Wednesday, he says he's giving mind blowing about tefillin. I'll be glad to show that, share that with you guys. But I think it's always good to find people that uh, to find people to study with, or you could do it online. The fact that we're live here, it's just important to have some sort of study each week, right, Marty? I know Marty's a big believer. Uh, ever since he moved up to Connecticut, finding people to study with and classes to go to, because there's nothing like sharing ideas with everyone. Um, and I that, don't think you. I don't think you can have a community yeah. without doing the things that you're trying to do yeah. because you know we anybody can say we all say don't do this don't. do this do that but don't have too many don't have too many well that's a you know it's 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 you, someone's opinion and yeah. the pe there are people saying don't do it don't do it and there's other people saying do it do it do it it's probably better to um be on the side of do it so yeah. it's always yeah. there for you when you need it and when you want it. And I, and I think you can't have community without it. You have to have something, you have to have a core. And, and tonight, Arlene, to the point, I'm glad we're studying in, in memory of Elizabeth. Thank I'm you. glad we're studying in memory of Sharon, who just passed away, Marty, on Shabbos while we were having our service. It's, it's just, you know, people dying so young, let's say 47, 68. I mean, yeah, I like to study right, Arlene, in their name. <laughs> You know, we believe that we elevate their soul by studying in their name. I believe it. And uh, you guys, I hope, believe it. I mean, you don't have to believe what I do. But I think the studies tonight, when they're targeted towards a certain soul, we always study and help elevate souls of all those we know. But, you know, we, you know, we have certain people uh, for certain days. It's, uh, it's a nice thing. I, I, I know it brings comfort to a family like you, Arlene, right? It absolutely um, does. To, to remember Elizabeth, even though we didn't know her personally, but just to, to know her, you know, uh, through you, through you, of course. Okay, so that was, uh, that was the uh, uh, Agatha today uh, uh, about, about Brachot, uh, going back to the 15 years ago that we studied this. Okay, so we're, let's go back to the topic. We're going to be probably done with it in the next month or so, I assume. So I hope everyone's got volume three ready to roll. Um, give you time next three, four weeks uh, to get it. Yeah, yeah we got okay. it. Where are we up to, Neil? You're the... I don't know. I missed last week. 81, 81A3. 81A3. Thank you. Yeah. Right hand column. Oh yeah. We just finished note twenty-seven. Okay, so Rob Papa used the same interpretation. That's what I have. I just want to double check because my red marker has a way to okay. Okay, so I think we have like uh hi Scott. I think we have like about four weeks. So we'll have a little little party when we finish this. So we'll see him and we'll go on to the next one. Since it's not a whole track date, we'll just have a little party. <laughs> okay. Um <laughs> Well, I think it's an accomplishment. Well, how long has it been, Neil, since we uh, started volume two of Bubba Mitzi? I don't even know how long it's been. Has it been Can't that long? Be. April of You're... 22. Okay, you guys, Sharon, you say. got it down there. So it's been Because I here. started at the end of the other book. So <laughs> I've been here this whole book. Okay, so 14 months. Okay. All right. That's interesting. A statistic, actually. Okay. Okay, so I I assume it'll take us probably to finish the whole thing. That means about about another 16, 17 months probably to finish the whole thing. So we'll probably finish the whole thing at the end of the summer of uh, 2024. Then we'll have a real party. <laughs> Rav Papa used the same interpretation to explain the Brisa. So Tana Rabbanon always means guys. Rabbi, can you just stop for a second uh, yeah. and go back and... Uh... If you go yeah. back to the Mishnah and just go over what it is we're talking about, those three items, the, yeah. the Bailey who uh, um, 
Where's the Mishnah? I'm not finding it. Eighty B two. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just found it. Okay, that was a so it a talked long about one. the. If you look okay. at note sixteen, it kind of summarizes everything. If you go to page eighty B two, note sixteen, it talks about pretty much what we're talking about here. And it delineates the three categories of people who are entrusted with the property of another. All oh, right, right. The uh, the pay, unpaid shomer, the paid shomer, and a borrower. Okay. We we've seen this be uh, de designation a while ago. We've talked about yes. the shomer before. I don't think we right. talked about the borrower. No. Right. So a paid it's just unpaid. That, it's just important that we all, uh, for those of us that missed last week, it's important okay. that we all understand that that's what we're talking about here. Okay. okay, those three categories. Gotcha, and that's in that's in the Exodus. So, um, uh, okay, that's that's right out of the Torah. Okay, so um, so it says in this brisa, this external teaching, it says shmor live shmor lecha. So shmor shomer is to again is to watch. If someone says to another, it says watch my property for me, Lee. And I will watch your property, lecha, for you. Hashileni vashliach, or lend your property to me, and chazara, and in return, I will lend my property back to you. Shmoli veeshelchek, or watch my property for me, and I will lend. Ashelcha, uh, I will lend my property to you. Hashileni or He's saying, lend your property to me, and then Eshmor, I will watch your property for you. So it's saying that all these cases, all these are paid shomrim for one another. Neil, you're the leadoff guy normally, right? All right. What are we at? 28? 28, yeah. yes. Even in the case of lend your property to me, and I will lend my property to you. Neither party carries a borrower's liability for unavoidable accidents. The special liability of a borrower extends only to when it has full use of the borrowed object free of charge. In this case, however, the borrower lends something in return. Since his borrowing is not gratis, he is not subject to the full liability of a borrower. Okay. So the Gemara is gonna ask on this statement, by my, but why are they liable even as paid shormim? It's a case of watching and property with the owner in one's service. 29, Neil. The Not all there. the cases listed in the Baraisa are cases in which the owner of the object is working for the one for whom it is entrusted. In fact, only the first case, watch my property for me and I will watch your property for you, is of this type. See note 26. And there's only this case that is questioned by the Gemara. It is obvious that in the case of watch for me and I will lend to you and lend to me and I will watch for you, the owner is not working for the Shomer. However, Rashi's assertion that even in the case of lend me and I will lend you is not one of watching an item with the owner in one's service requires explanation. Since one who borrows an item must take care of it on behalf of the owner, surely he is performing a service for the owner. Apparently, a borrower is viewed as looking after the borrowed item for his own purposes to use the item. He is not viewed as though he is looking after the item for its owner. Okay. So, so does anybody does anybody see like a um, a correlation to the uh, to the whole ribis thing if you're gaining something ribis uh was always an act they always said well you know if you get anything then it's ribis yeah in this case if you're getting anything then you become a paid borrower so it, it's kind of interesting how they they tie those two things together yeah. um, it's true you're, you're, you're gaining assimilation uh, assimilation here yeah you're gaining your the thing that you are getting is worth more than the thing that you are lending to him. So therefore, this is basically you're gaining something out of the transaction, which is ribbis. Exactly. So that's, that's why. Yeah. 
but that's why even they're having a hard time with the, well, if I lend to you, Neil, and you lend to me, well, that's a fair shot, right? So even they're having a hard time with that. And that's where the discussion has to go. Yeah, I can see a whole lot of differential, different uh, opinions on this coming. Well, and it's interesting. And I think along, I think this is along what you're saying. So if you borrow the item, it's, you're not worried about, since you're really not worried about who owns it, you're worried about yourself and using it. And I think that that makes a divide for not having Rivas because it's not, it's not to the owner's benefit. It's just your own benefit. Yeah. Right. And, and you're most culpable for uh, the wider range of uh, disasters that could befall it. Right. Whatever that thing right. is. Yeah. Yeah. Any other opinions? Anyway, that was twenty. Okay. So, Pop is responding to this. He said, "The case he's saying is that he said to him, watch my property for me today, and then I am going to watch your property tomorrow.'" See note twenty-seven. Okay, so that's what they talked about there. What do you? Yeah. One day. Okay. So the Gemara is recording an incident in which a Shomer assumed responsibility for an article while its owner was apparently in the service of him. It says, Hanu Ahule. <laughs> These were detergent dealers, 31. Um, who's up next? Uh, Arlene, you want to take over? Sure. Literally, Ohil dealers, an extract of the Ohel plant was used for washing clothes. Alternatively, these were dealers in aloe from the verse Ahalot. Um, from the verse Mer and aloes in the Psalms 49, 45, 9. That's it. Aloe. Okay. Is, it makes it aloe is aloe. Okay. So the whole Yoma each day, who had an arrangement, whereas each day in a different one of them, Baked bread for the whole group. Hahu yoma amrule lemacha minayu. One day yomacha. They said they said to one of the numbers, their numbers, zil apailan, go afe is to bake. Go bake for us. Amalu nitru li galime. Said to them, watch my cloak for me. Admata pashu vavi inglu. When he came back from the baking, they were negligent with his cloak and what happened, it was stolen. This isn't the same cloak from the original. <laughs> Who owns I know. It's not, is it the same? I hope it's not. Go ahead. That one gets around. <laughs> these were the guys finding it. Or these were the guys who lost it. As opposed to the guys finding it. <laughs> 32. The Gemara assumes that it was this person's day to bake. Thus his baking cannot be construed as payment for watching the cloak. Therefore, the ones watching the cloak were unpaid for him and were liable only for negligence. For this reason, the Gemara stresses that they were negligent because if the loss was not through their negligence, they would not be liable, according to Rashi. Absolutely negligence, no question. Yeah. yeah. So, Atu Lakame Dura Papa. So Ato means they came before a papa for a ruling. They came there, they had a purpose. Kai Vinhu, he obligated them, Kayav. I uh, obligated them to compensate the owner for the loss of the cloak. Amrule Rabban el Papa. The rabbis said to Rabbi Papa this, Am I, again, why are they liable? Shita bivalimhi. It's a case of negligence on the owner of the Shomer who assumed responsible for the owner in his service, 33. The owner of the cloak was baking for those who were watching his cloak. 
In such a case, the Torah rules that a Shomer is not liable, see note 26. Why then did Rev Papa obligate the Shorim? So, let's see if Rav Papa was embarrassed. The Sof Irglai Milta. In the end, it was revealed the Hahu Shata, Shata's hour, at that time, Shikra Hava Kashate. That at the time they so specific the cloak. What was he doing? He was drink, he was drinking beer, shikra, <laughs> drinking beer, and he hadn't started baking. Thus, they were indeed liable for the cloak. Thirty-four. Since the owner of the cloak had not yet seriously committed himself to baking at the time, the others assumed responsibility for guarding his cloak. The exemption of watching with the owner in one service is not applicable. Hence, they are treated like regular Sharim who are obligated to compensate the owner for loss or damage through negligence to the entrusted article. See Tosa post below. It should be noted that the law of watching with the owner in one service applies where the owner was working for the Shomer when the Shomer assumed responsibility, regardless of whether he was working for the Shomer at the time of the mishap. In our case, if the owner of the cloak had started baking right away, the Sharim would not be ob obligated to pay him, even if he would have been drinking beer when the cloak was stolen, according to Rashi. As so today, today's Papa message, had... today's message, don't start baking right away, drink beer. <laughs> yeah, the baking will be better. The Gemara analyzed the previous incident in the light of an Aramaic dispute. Anita Laman Damar Pshia This account of the incident fits well according to the one who says that even in a case of negligence, on the part of a Shomer, who is soon responsible with the owner in his service, the Shomer is not liable to compensate the owner here. There is a dispute below in 95A concerning the exemption of a Shomer who assumed responsibility for an article while the owner was in his service. One Amora holds that this explanation applies only to a borrower and a paid Shomer who are liable even for losses that do not result from negligence. It does not apply to an unpaid Shomer who is likely only for negligence, who is liable only for negligence. In effect, this means that every Shomer is liable for negligence, even if the owner was in his service when he assumed responsibility. But another Amara holds that the exemption applies even to an unpaid Shomer who is liable only for negligence. In his view, any Shomer who assumed responsibility while the owner was in his service is not liable even for negligence, according to Rashi. That's 35, okay. Mishum Haki Ixif. Because of this, Rav Papa was embarrassed, Ixif, he was embarrassed, about his ruling when it was pointed out to him, the owner of the cloak was in this, <laughs> the owner of the cloak was in the service of those watching it for him, 36. The Shareem should not have been obligated to pay even though they were negligent. Hence, Rav Papa's ruling, which obligated them to pay, seemed incorrect. And accordingly, he was embarrassed. So, Ella Lamanda Marchayev. According to what it says, negligence, a Shomer is liable, even if the owner was working for him, when he assumed responsibility, Amai Yixif. Why was Rav Papa embarrassed? His ruling was, if it's correct, why was he embarrassed? Since those guarding the cloak were negligent, they should be liable, even though the owner was working for them when they assumed responsibility. Ralph Papa's ruling was therefore correct, even for the case as it was originally presented, that is, with the assumption that the owner was already working for them when they assumed responsibility. Why then was Ralph Papa embarrassed by the rabbi's question? 
The Gemara answers the incident didn't occur as it was assumed previously. Rather, that day was not his day to bake. Okay. But they, his fellow, his dealers said to him, Zil Apaleat, you go bake for us. It's not the day, but do it if I'm low. And he said to them, Bahu Agra de Ka as payment for my baking for you, the Torah believe me. Watch my cloak. Contrary to our original assumption, see note 32, the cloak owner was doing the others a favor by agreeing to bake, since according to the schedule, it was not his turn to bake that day. This favor constituted payment for their watching of his cloak. Accordingly, they were not unpaid shorim, but paid shorim, who were liable even for theft and loss that is not due to their negligence, according to Rashi. Okay, next page, 81B1. Adiata Igniv. Before he came back from baking, his cloak was stolen. Number one, Sharon, are you available to read? Sure. According to this version of the narrative, the theft was not due to negligence on the part of the Shamrim, according to Rashi. Atu Lakame Dara Papa. So they came before our Papa, they wanted a ruling. Hivinhu, he obligated them to pay for the stolen coat. Amru le Rabbana le Rab Papa. The Rabbi said to this Papa, Ha Shmire Bichlaim he. This is a case of watching an item with the owner in one service. The Shomrim, therefore, should not be obligated to pay it. Yixif, our Papa again was embarrassed. According to this version, those watching the cloak were paid shomrim, who are liable for the even for theft that is not due to negligence, see 81A note 38. And indeed, this incidence of theft was not due to their negligence, see previous note. Hence, it is understandable why Rob Papa was embarrassed, for everyone agrees that the exemption of watching the owner in one service applies to theft that did not result from negligence. Number two, okay. The soft iglai milta dahayishata shira havashate. In the end though, it was revealed that at the time that they assumed responsibility for the cloak, he was drinking the beer and he didn't begin baking it. Thus, they were indeed obligated to pay for the cloak as Rabbi Papa had ruled earlier. See 81A note 34. So, okay, so we're gonna have another case here which mistakenly thought that a shomer is a responsibility for an article while the owner was still working for him again. So it says, I don't betray Dahavuka, Masku, or Orcha. There were these two men who were going down a road. One was tall and one was short. Arich is long, Guza is short. Guza. Arich and Rakiv de Chamra. Tall one rode a donkey, the Havale Stina, and had a linen garment. Goza Mirse Tarbla. Short was wrapped in a woolen cloak. Baka Masu Bechari. And he was walking on his feet, on foot. Ki mate le nahara. When he reached the nahar, the river, shakle le le sarble vo otve ilaze chamra. Then he got to this river. The short man, he took his woolen cloak and he put it on the donkey. <laughs> what happened then? The shalkit le stay hahu vikse be. And he took the other man's linen garment, he wrapped himself in it. He wrapped him, his own self in it. Wool becomes very heavy when wet, whereas linen does not. Since the short man was going to wade through the river on foot, he put his woolen cloak on the donkey where it would stay dry above the water and wrapped himself in the tall man's linen garment, according to Rashi. 
Okay, so. Shafua, Shatufa, Shafua, Maya, this Dine. The current of water, Maya, swept away the linen garment. Atalakame de Rava. He came for Rava for a ruling. Chaybe. Rafa obligated him to pay for this linen garment. The short man had borrowed the linen garment, and a borrower is liable even for unavoidable accidents. So, Amru le Rabbi le Rava. Rabbi said to Rava, Am I? Why is he obligated to pay? Shela bivalimhi. It's a case of borrowing an item with the owner in one service. When the short man borrowed the linen garment, the tall man was transporting the short man's woolen cloak on his donkey. Hence, this is a case of the owner, the tall man, being in the service of a shomer, the short man, at the moment the shomer assumed responsibility. In such a case, the Torah exempts the shomer from liability, C81 note 26. Why then did Rava obligate the short man to pay? This was not the case in which each one loaned his garment to the other, where the exemption of watching the, with the owner in one service does not apply. See 81 note 29. For the tall man had no use for the short man's cloak, according to Rit, Ritva, old, Possibly this is why the Gemara specifies that the owner of the woolen cloak was short and the other man was tall. The Gemara thereby indicates that the short man's cloak was too small for the tall man. What I'm not understanding is, did the tall man offer his linen garment to the short man? And if he did offer it, then he was part of the agreement of the short man taking his linen garment. It seems, or did he uh, just take it? Did he just take the linen garment or was it well, offered? He was, he was wrapped in, the, the tall man was wrapped in it. So he, he had to be, the short man had to be given the linen garment. Right. But there's a lot missing here. Did, did, the, uh, did the tall man wrap the, wrap the wool blanket around him? It doesn't say whether he did or he didn't. It just says that the uh, that the wool blanket was put on the donkey. Right, and then they're they're just making an assumption that the owner of the woolen cloak cloak was short and the other man was tall, and that the woolen cloak wouldn't fit the it wouldn't have a purpose on the tall man because it was too short. I mean, it's just. A, I, I'm not sure that they really say that, but they sort of make an assumption that because the man was tall, the garment was too short for him. So he put it on the donkey. When I was first reading this, I was thinking, you loan me mine and I'll loan you your, you know, you loan me mine and you get the idea. We're each loaning yeah. each other the, the garments, the respective garments. But they're saying, no, they're, they're saying that they took a, a completely differently. And well, they're saying seven that, is uh, interesting. the short guy needed the garment and the tall guy didn't. So I'm not sure where it says that, where they're well, deriving it from. Number seven, I, I just read the first line of number seven and that, that makes it very interesting. It sort of answers my question. Oh, okay. So they gave us half a story and now they're explaining it in the in the <laughs> notes. Exactly. I mean, where did it where did it get down to he stole it? Exactly. I mean, it's wrapped around the it, it's, it's wrapped, wrapped around, around the ball body. guy's How shoulder, you... right? How did he steal it? I was wondering about that. And then he stole it and and uh and it was He's such a thief that he left behind his woolen cloak. Right. And he's walking right. alongside the other guy anyway. Exactly. Yeah. 
I mean, if you steal something, don't you run away with it? I mean, the guy was standing right next to him. There's got to be more to this. Let, let, we'll just keep reading. Yeah, we've seen that before. We're about four paragraphs later, suddenly it suddenly makes sense. <laughs> and in the other examples, it was sort of a, you lend me yours, I'll lend you mine. This doesn't sound like this situation. No. Okay, that was six, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ixif, again, embarrassment for Rava. Lasov Iglai Milta Devai Data Shakle. In the end, though, Lasov, it was revealed that the short man had taken the tall man's linen garment without the tall man's knowledge. And he placed his woolen cloak on the donkey without the man's knowledge. The tall man. <laughs> And thus, the short man was obligated to pay his robber rules. Seven. Since the short man had borrowed the other's garment without permission, he's classified as a thief. The law is that a thief is liable for whatever happens to the property he stole. And the exemption of having the owner in one's service does not apply. The Gemara adds that the tall man did not know that the short man's woolen cloak was placed on his donkey because if he did know, he surely would have realized that the short man had taken his linen garment. And thus, this would not be a case of borrowing without the owner's permission, according to Ritva O. In Mary's version of the text, the words Below Datai Shakla, the short man had taken the tall man's linen garment without the tall man's knowledge, do not appear. According to this version, the Gemara is stating a different reason for the short man's obligation to pay. Namely, the tall man never agreed to transport the short man's cloak. Hence, the tall man was not in the service of the short man, and the exemption of watching with the owner in one's service did not apply. This makes no sense whatsoever. Okay, maybe it'll make it, sense. It, it kind of, Sharon, it, what they're saying here, though, is, is that he didn't steal it. They're coming up with an alternative solution. So they know what, they know what the uh, result was, right? They know that uh, he was being told he had to pay. Now they're trying to figure out why he had to pay, right? Okay. Why was it that the ruling was that he had to pay? So they're trying to come up with alternate scenarios that are going to that are going to bring that you know that are going to make that happen. So now here they're saying, okay, well he didn't he didn't steal it, but he didn't. Let the other guy know, the other guy know. Put the woolen one on the donkey. So since he didn't, it was a one-way transaction. And since it was a one-way transaction, he borrowed it. And since he borrowed it, he had to pay for the negligence. That makes more sense than it did before by saying that he stole it. Okay. They they said the same thing we did. Where does it say that? Where does it say they stole it? Exactly. And if you, how, okay. I, I no, guess I'm just question? analyzing, how do you take a linen garment off of a person who's wrapped in it without the person knowing? I, I guess I'm just, look, maybe I'm looking at it the wrong way. I think now what they're saying is, is that the tall man let the short man have the linen garment. That's the alternate explanation. He let him have the alternate gar uh, uh, linen garment, but yeah. he didn't know that the wool garment was put on the donkey. Yeah, if, if you look at the specific words, it says the, the tall one rode a donkey and had a linen garment, not specifically that he was wrapped in it. Just that he had a linen garment, but the short one was wrapped in a woolen cloak. So it it doesn't specifically say that the tall one was wrapped in a linen garment, just that he had one. Well, that's good. 
Good catch. Seven, Robin. Okay, finish with that. Okay. Um, the Gemara. By, the, by the way, I looked in Steinsalt, and it's moved yeah, oh, to this whole discussion. There? It's moved to the whole discussion. There, there's nothing in there about this discussion. Really? Mm. Yeah. Ah. The Gemara is relating an incident then involving a renter who disobeyed the owner's instruction. Hahu Gavra. Gever is a man. Okay, there was a man. Dogele Chamer Lechavre. Gever is a friend again. He rented his donkey to his fellow Amale. Owner said to the renter this. Chaze, see here. Lo tizob orcha denahapakod. What happened? Do not go into the road by the Pekod Nahar, the river. The Ika Maya, Maya's water, where there's water which can sweep things away. Zil Borcha de Garish. Go instead to the Neresh. Go to the Neresh road. The Lake Maya, where there is no water. The rent that disobeyed the instructions. What did he do? Azil, he went. Borcha de Nahar Pakod, Umit Chamra. He went to the Code River and the donkey died. Mate is dead. The donkey is now dead. So, what happens? Uh, he Ata Amar, when he came back, he said this Ain Baorcha Denar Pakod Azle. Yes, it's true. I went on the road by you told the Bakod River, Umihu Lake Amaya, but there was no water there. The donkey died, right? No water, unavoidable. So other causes, though, says okay, other causes. So I'm not obligated to pay them. The renter argued that the death of the donkey should be treated as an unavoidable mishap for which a renter is not liable. This does not contradict the law that a shomer who disobeys the owner's instructions is liable to pay even for unavoidable mishaps because that law applies only where the loss of the entrusted item can be attributed to the lack of compliance with the owner's instructions. In this case, however, the only difference between the Picard River Road and the Neresh Road was the presence of water. Indeed, the owner specified the presence of water as the reason for avoiding the Picode River Road. Therefore, since the Shomer claims that the animal's death had nothing to do with the water, he should not have to pay, according to Rivka. See Tosifos. I wonder if that's the same river as the short man and the tall man. <laughs> Probably. I thought there was going to be water and it was going to be swept away and that the whole thing would be about, well, I told you not to go on that road. That would have been easy. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's this obvious. We're not, a, we're not about easy. Yeah, this is, this is way different. Rabbi, that was eight. Okay. So Rava's ruling on that matter, Amr le Rava. Rava said to him this, Ma le le sheka. What reason does the renter have to lie by saying he went on the road by the Pakot River and there was no water there? E by Amar le Araborcha Daenerys Azle. If he was going to lie, he could have said, I went on the Neresh road. Therefore, we should believe him when he says no water on the road by the Pakod River. Rava reasons that the renter should be believed that there was no water because if he were lying, he would have used a better lie, namely that he had gone on the Neresh road as requested by the owner. Since the renter acknowledged that he went on the road by the Pakod River, contrary to the owner's instructions, he clearly is not interested in lying. 
Accordingly, his claim that the donkey's death was not due to water should be believed, see Ritva. An apparent difficulty. Why did Rava have to explain why the renter is believed? The burden of proof rests upon the owner. In accordance with the principle, Hamotzi Mahaveru Alav Haraya, the burden of proof is on the one who seeks to exact from his fellow. The explanation is that since there usually is water on the Pequod River Road, the renter would not have been believed to say that there was no water there. Unless there were grounds for believing him, see the continuation of the Gemara. Okay. Um... Next note, Mars, you want to take over next page? We're on 81B2. Sure. Abaye challenged the ruling. So what happened? Amale Abaye. Abaye said, Mali le shakem makom edim lo amrinan. We do not apply this argument of what reason does he have to lie in a situation with our witnesses who contradict what he says all the time. Ten. It First was note. known that there was always water on the Pequod River Road. This was considered certain, just as if it had been testified to by witnesses. See Rashi and Ritva. Old? Okay. Thus the claim of the renter that there was no water there is tantamount to a claim that runs counter to the testimony of witnesses. Such a claim is, in, is unacceptable, and the renter is therefore liable for the death of the donkey. Rava maintained, however, that it was a possibility, albeit a remote one, that on that particular day, there was no water there. Hence, the renter's claim is feasible and should be accepted. See Ritva Old. Does this imply there were witnesses or not? No, 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 no. They're saying that there were written. If, I read if, that they were, right. if they were witnesses. All right. They're saying okay. that the witnesses just said that there was always water there. Okay. Yeah. Not that I mean, they everybody... saw that there was water there when he got there. Okay. All that's right. not a that's that's a very, very bad distinction. Yeah. I want to know where this donkey is. What's that? I want to know where this donkey is. Exactly. Did it drown? Yeah, that, or didn't that question. It? Yeah. Is he waterlogged or not? Yeah. Right. I mean, where, where's the donkey at this moment? Is he lying on which road? And I suppose there's a possibility there could have been a drought and the water dried up. Yeah, I mean, the, the fact that there's no water there is possible. Right. Yeah, we need to find the donkey. Uh, bottom line. Yeah. We need to know if the donkey drowned or died of dehydration. Aha. Rabbi, that was 10. Well, we may not know. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Gamara is citing the next case. <sighs> if one says to Another, watch my property for me. And the other replies, put it down in front of me. The respondent is an unpaid showmare. Um, the Gemara investigates the law, where instead of responding, put it down in front of me, which clearly implies a willingness to guard the article, the person responds with a different formula. Amar of Huna. Rav Huna says, Amar lo hanach lefanecha. If he said to him, put it down in front of you, he's neither an unpaid shomer nor a paid uh, shomer. His response, put it down in front of you, means that he does not undertake to watch the object. It is like saying, put it down and watch it yourself, according to Rashi. Therefore, even if he was offered payment, he is not at all responsible for the article. The Gemara is raising an inquiry. Ibailu, they're asking now. 
They asked, what is the law where he said, put it down without further specification? Does this formula mean put it down and I will watch it? Or does it mean put it down and watch it yourself? That was 12. Okay. The Gemara adduces a proof. Tashma. Okay. That was 12, right? Um, yeah. Okay. So, sorry. Someone's trying to call me. Okay. Um, come and learn. Shmorli, if one says to another, watch my property for me, and the other replies, put it in front of me. Shomer Chinam, then it's an unpaid Shomer by specifying a case in which the respondent said, There's no obligation at all. Oh, okay, 13. If the respondent becomes a shomer, even where he says only, put it down, the Mishnah surely would have specified that case, for then it would go without saying that when he responds, put it down in front of me, he becomes a shomer. Okay, that was 13. Rabbi, shouldn't he have to acquire it? I mean, we, we went to Grain Lanes to talk about the uh, the whole requirement for acquisition. It yeah. seems like it seems like he should have to acquire it some way. Dropping it at his feet doesn't necessarily doesn't at all, it, by any means acquire anything. I have a problem with this. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the problem is you have some implication if you just say put it down. To me that implies an implication that I will watch it because otherwise you, if I wasn't gonna watch it, then you would hang on to it. So putting it down implies to me that indeed I will watch it, which yeah. gets me into the unpaid Shomer mode. I, I agree with you, Neil, that it, it just seems like in every other case, we made a big deal out of the requirement to uh, physically re acquire right. it. And then yeah. there are certain methods based upon what the object is that you know you can acquire it one way or the other, but it has to be a formal acquisition. Um, this and this be doesn't an meet any of those requirements. Yeah. <clears throat> I know, it gets a little fuzzy here. Which one was that? In, in the Number. examples, it's clear, right? Um, I'll take yours, I'll borrow yours, you'll borrow mine, I'll take yours, you'll take, but this is like, there's no consent, put it down. Yeah, exactly. There's an implied consent, which is indeed implied. a legal term. But when it comes to Jewish law, implied, I mean, I, we went to great lanes to talk about acquisition and how we acquire. Remember the, the whole donkey, right? We right. Had oh, yeah. That, you couldn't you couldn't just get up on the dunk you couldn't just get up on it you had to get up on it and ride it three steps right yeah or you had to take the reins and, and bring it three steps or if it was a movable object right. it was something yeah. else if yeah. it was a if it was land which was an immovable object then it was something else but you had to physically acquire it so here we're saying that you know we're taking on a responsibility or we're not and there should be some for, formal way of acquisition. That's just the way I see it. Yeah, I mean, you're also looking at an intent, intention here, which is, again, not helpful at all. Yeah. But generally, right. it seems to be generally in the things we've discussed, it's this way or that way. There's not a lot of in between. So you have to, so I feel like person should have said, put it down, I'll keep it for you. Saying I'll put it down doesn't doesn't um, fit well with my understanding of the of Jewish laws in general that we've studied. 
exactly. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. It's, I'm curious to see what the ruling is here for that reason. Oh, yes. <laughs> Okay. The Gemara objects. Thirteen. The Gemara objects. Adaraba always means on the contrary. Adaraba. On the contrary, what happens? Midamar of Huna. From what Rabbi Huna said, the opposite conclusion could be derived by specifying the case to put it down in front of you. Huna implies Hanach lefanecha hu. It is where he said, "Put in front of you." Deino lo shomer chinav lo shomer sachar. It's neither an unpaid shomer nor a paid shomer. Hastama shomer chinam havi. But if he said put it down without further specification, then he is an unpaid shomer fourteen. fourteen. If by responding put it down, one does not become a shomer. Rav Huna would have specified such a case, since Rav Huna specifies put it down in front of you. It may be inferred that a person who responds, put it down, means in fact that he agrees to watch it. My theory. <laughs> well, that makes a little bit of sense. So what is the Gemara concluding now? That it's saying, Ella naha leka lemishma mina. From here, it's not possible. He had to derive an answer. To the inquiry. <laughs> Great. The implication of the Mishnah seems to be that by <laughs> saying, put it down, one does not agree to safeguard the item in question. But the implication of Rav Huna's teaching is that such a statement does count as an agreement to safeguard the item. Therefore, no proof can be adduced either way. The following difficulty must be addressed. How can the Gemara use a proof derived from the statement of an Amara, Rav Huna, to counter the proof from our Mishnah? The ruling of a Mishnah carries more weight than that of an Amara. Rashba answers, Rav Huna derived his ruling from our Mishnah. He reasoned that since the Mishnah specified the case of put it down in front of me, it is evident that where the respondent said put it down in front of you, he does not undertake to safeguard the object. The Gemara notes that Rav Huna deliberately avoided the case where the respondent merely said, put it down. It is therefore evident from Rav Huna's statement that contrary to the Gemara's initial assumption, no proof can be derived from our Mishnah regarding the case of saying, put it down alone. Uh, Rashba is cited by Shatamak Ubetzes and C. Ritva. Good, that makes sense. The Gemara is suggesting the meaning of put it down in this context, disputed by Tanayim. What does it say? Lema Katani. Shall we say that the issue is the same as that disputed by the time in the following Mishnah? In Bava, comma 47b. <laughs> okay, we're in Hichnis Bershut. So if you brought property into the yard with permission, Rashut, the owner of the yard, the owner said, come in, and it was damaged there by the yard's owner's animals. The owner of the yard is obligated to pay the damage. Rabbi Omer, Rabbi says, in all these cases, Seventeen. this Mishnah discusses several cases in which one person brings objects into the yard of another, and they are damaged there. The owner of the yard is not obligated to pay. Unless what? The owner of the yard expressly accepts upon himself, guard the other's property. We see from the Mishnah that the Tanakhama guards come in as equivalent to come in and I will guard it for you. Rebbe, however, explains, come in and meeting, come in and watch it for yourself. Hence, in our case, Tanakama would truly explain, put it down, is meaning, put it down, I will guard it for you. Well, Rebbe would explain it, put it down, and I watch it yourself. Gemara is rejecting the analogy on the grounds that the aforementioned Mishnah deals with a private yard, whereas our Mishnah refers to exchange that took place on a street. We might, from what do you uh, conclude, it's equivalent to the case of our Mishnah. 
Dilma, Akan Lo Kamari Rabbi Chatam. Maybe the sages didn't say what they said there, Ella Bechatzer Devat Neturahi, except concerning a yard in which is a place for safekeeping. The Chi Kamale Ayu. And so when the yard owner says him, come in, Azul Dinala Kamale. He means come in so I can watch property for you. Okay, we're at 18. Um, yeah. Since the yard is a private secure area, it is easy to safeguard things there. And a person will bring things there for safekeeping. The yard owner therefore realizes that the reason why the other person is bringing his property into the yard is that he wants the yard owner to watch it. Hence the yard owner's response indicates agreement to watch the article in question, according to Rashi. Why can't they just be clear and say, put it down, I'll watch it for you? They, uh, very frequently, people are not as clear as you'd like them to be. Yeah, I think it's, if the uh, two people in question were clear, they wouldn't bother talking about it. And, and you yeah. don't know, and, and you don't know the circumstances. It sounds like it must have, might have been something that was done quickly or in a bit of a rush and and you you forget to say everything or you was just assume right both parties assume two different yeah. things yeah I yeah. Agree. 18 rabbi avalha shuka la bar naturehu exchange took place in a street shuka which is not a place of safekeeping one responds put it down in a street He's saying the owner, put it down and sit and guard it yourself. Rebbe did not say what he said there, except concerning one's yard, 81B3. Um, regarding which one needs to receive permission from the owner in order to enter. And thus, when the owner gives him permission to enter, he's merely saying, sit and guard it yourself. Uh, Marty, you're up, I think, 19. A mere entry into someone's yard requires permission. We assume, therefore, that the owner of the yard did nothing more than grant permission to enter. He did not accept responsibility for the objects. That's interesting. Okay. That was 19. Aval uh, Hacha. In the case discussed, Hacha here, Heinavana Minatra Kamale. He is saying, put it down, I will guard it for you. The E Salka Data Vitar Kamale. Because if it should enter your mind that he is saying, then put it down and sit and guard it yourself. Since referring only to putting it down, does the owner need to take permission from him to do that? Twenty. If Ruben says to Shimon, watch my article for me, and Shimon replies, put it down. If Shimon did not mean that he is prepared to watch it, why did he respond? Surely Ruben does not require Shimon's approval to put something down in the street. Therefore, Rebbe might agree that put it down in the street means put it down and I will watch it for you. That was 20, okay. Uh, the Gemara cites the next case of the mission. It's saying the Gemara, Halval Mishkan Mishmor Sachar. So one who lends to another against the security of the paid Shomer, is liable for loss or damage security, even if it's not due to his negligence. Kamara is investigating. Okay. Lema, Aditin, below Rabbi Elazar, shall we say the Mishnah is inconsistent, Rav Elazar, the Tanya, because it says in a, a price of this. If you're lending to your fellow against the security, 
the avad hamashkon and the security uh, is lost. Avad, it's lost. Yishavu v'yutol ma otav. The lender swears that he was not negligent and he collects the money. David Rebbe These are the words of Elazar, 21. Uh, Rebbe Lazar, Rebbe Eliezer, it maintains that the lender is regarded as an unpaid shomer in respect to the security. An unpaid shomer is liable only for negligence. Accordingly, the lender swears that the loss of the security was not due to his negligence and hence does not owe the borrower anything for it since the lender carries no liability for the security, its loss does not affect the debt he is owed by the borrower. And so he collects the money in full. Rashi. Akiva says this. Yechol Omerlo. So the borrower can then say to him this. Kulum Vitani Ella Adamashkon. You didn't lend me except against the security. Avada mashkon avol motecha. If it's in security's lost, then too bad. Your money's lost. Twenty-two. The Gemara assumes at this point that, according to Rabbi Akiva, the primary reason a security is taken is so that some of the borrower's property will be available to the lender to acquire in the event that the borrower does not pay the loan. The security is thus mortgaged to the lender and the lender enjoys a degree of ownership in it from the outset. The monetary right in the security is reviewed as the lender's payment for safeguarding it, making him a paid shomer. Hence, if the security is lost, even without negligence, the lender must bear its loss, according to Rashi. If the security is worth less than or of the same of the loan, the lender cannot collect the amount that corresponds to the value of the security. If the security is worth more than the loan, the lender must pay the balance to the borrower. Accordingly, according, according to Rebbe Eliezer, however, a, secure, a security is not viewed as a potential payment, unless, of course, the borrower defaults on the loan. A security functions merely as a record of the loan, which prevents the borrower from denying his obligation. Since in the interim, the lender does not enjoy any monetary rights in the security. He is only an unpaid shomer in regard to it. Once again, no document. We're relying on somebody borrow or being paying a security amount of money as being proof that this was a loan? Hmm. Weird. It's not I'll tied go. together for me well. What was that? I said it's not tying together for me well yet. No. Yeah. Vahu Elab Zuz the star. However, if you lent them a thousand zoos and recorded in a Star is a loan document. Okay. Vinech lo mashkon alehem. The borrower left the lender a security against the money. Divre akol. In the opinion of everyone, avad mashkon abdul malta. Security is lost, his money then is lost. 23. Okay. A loan document. Yay. In addition <laughs> to serving as a record of the loan, mortgages of the bar mortgages the borrower's real estate to the lender. Hence, when a lender has a loan document, he is not concerned that the borrower will, will deny the debt or that he will be unable to collect it. Therefore, if a lender who has a loan document also takes a security from the, the borrower, it is clear that the security is not intended merely as a record of the loan. In such a case, both Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Eliezer agree that the security is taken for the purpose of having on hand a mortgage security, and the lender is therefore a paid shomer in regard to it. Hmm. Okay. Ravelazar's position that a lender is an unpaid shomer 
with respect to a security seems to be inconsistent with the Mishnah's position that a lender is a paid shomer with respect to a security, or attempts to reconcile the view of Elazar with the Mishnah. You can even say the Mishnah is consistent with Elazar below Kasha. And then there's not a Kasha, there's no difficulty. Kan Shikno because here, Ravella was ruling in the case that the lender took the security from the borrower at the time he extended the loan. Whereas here in the Mishnah, the case is that he took the security at a time other than when he extended the loan. That is, he took it after attempting to collect the loan. 20, 24. Rebbe Eliezer's ruling in the Baraisa refers to a case where the lender took the security at the time he extended the loan. It is in such a case that Rebbe Eliezer understands the purpose of the security to be merely a record of the loan. But in the Mishnah's case, the security was not taken at the time of the loan. Rather, after unsuccessfully demanding payment from the borrower, the lender seized the security from the borrower by court order. Certainly, such, uh, such a security is intended as a mortgaged object, and consequently, Rabbi Eliezer agrees that the lender is a paid shomer with regard to it. That makes sense. Yeah. The Gemara is rejecting. Neil, I think you could be up again. Baha'i Edi Edi. Both the Mishnah and the Bryce are both of them. 82A2, Avahu al Mashkon Katani. Say one who lends another against security, which implies that the security was taken at the time of the loan. Therefore, how could it be suggested that the Mishnah for security that was taken after collection was attempted? Gamar proposes a different way to reconcile El Azar with the price of the Mishnah. El Alokasha, rather he's saying there is no difficulty. Khan Shavamot. Here, he ruled that the lender is an unpaid shomer, the case that he lent the money. Here, our mission is ruling that the lender a paid shomer, the case that he lent him produce. Number one, Neil, I think you're up again. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Since produce will rot, one gains by lending his produce and receiving fresh produce in its stead at the time of payment. This gain is regarded as the lender's reward for safeguarding the property, making him a paid shomer. The Gemara reconciles Rev Eliezer's ruling with our Mishnah by asserting that Rev Eliezer considers the lender an unpaid shomer only in the case where the loan was of money. But regarding a loan of produce, Rev Eliezer would agree with the Mishnah's ruling that the lender is a paid shomer. The Gemara is objecting to the answer here. It says, but it's saying here, um, the latter part, Seifa is the latter part. The latter part of the mission is saying, Rabbi Yehuda says, if he lent him money as an unpaid shomer, he becomes. Avahu Perot Shomer Sachar. If he lent him produce, he is a paid Shomer. Michal de la Tana Takama Lo Shanale. It follows that the Tanakama of the Mishnah does not distinguish between produce and money, then, too. Since Rabbi Yehuda disputes the Tanakama by distinguishing between produce and money, it is evident that the Tanakama does not make such a distinction. That was three, two. Huh? Oh, that was three. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Gemara attempts to overcome the objection by proposing a revision of the mission. So it says this. Kula Rabbi Yehudahi. The entire mission is the opinion of Rabbi Judah. Vachasure mechasra vachakatani. But as it is as though it's missing words, and this is how it should be taught this way. So one who lends another against the security is a paid shomer. 
Bamed Varim Amurim, in what case do these words apply? Tuvahu Perot, where he lent him Perot, which is produce. Okay, Aval. Aval Mot Shomer Chinam. But where he lent him money, he's an unpaid Shomer. So Rabbi Yehuda says this. Aval Mot Shomer Chinam. If he lent him money, however, then what happens? He is an unpaid Shomer. Aval Perot Shomer Fachat. But the produce, then he's a paid shomer, number four. This adjustment of the text of the Mishnah accomplishes that the Mishnah records a single opinion, Rev Yehuda, instead of there being two conflicting opinions, the Tanakama and Rev Yehuda. The Tanakama is, in fact, Rev Yehuda, who distinguishes between a loan of money and a loan of produce. Accordingly, our Mishnah is consistent with Rev Eliezer. For when Rev. Eliezer rules that the lender is an unpaid shomer with respect to a security, he refers to a loan of money, whereas the Mishnah's assertion that a lender is a paid shomer refers to a loan of produce. Gemara is rejecting this, however. So it's saying, Ihaki kamala matnitan de rabbi akiva. If so, the Mishnah isn't consistent then with Rabbi Akiva, number five. Number five. The Gemara in Sanhedrin 86a established that anonymous statements in the Mishnah represent the rulings of Rabbi Meir and are consistent with the views of his teacher, Rabbi Akiva. But according to the Gemara's answer, the anonymous statement in our Mishnah contradicts the view of Rabbi Akiva. The Mishnah states that one who lends money against the security is an unpaid shomer, whereas Rev Akiva maintains that even when where he loaned money, the lender is not an unpaid shomer. Okay. He is a paid shomer. Okay. The Gemara is concluding this then. Ella mechavrata matinin v'lokrov elazar. It's clear that our mission is not consistent then with good old Rabbi Eliezer. Six. <clears throat> Since the attempt to reconcile our Mishnah with Rev Eliezer inevitably leads to a contradiction between the Mishnah and Rev Akiva, the Gemara concludes that Rev Eliezer degreed, it disagrees with our Mishnah. Yeah. Okay. That was five or six. The Gemara proposes an explanation of the dispute between Elazar and Akiva as being related to a lender's liability for security. Lema bidlo shemashko and shuizezuze. Shall we say the case is that the security isn't equal in value to the sum of money that was lent? They're arguing over Shmuel's law, the Amar Shmuel. Shmuel said this, Haiman. The person lends a thousand zuz to his fellow, and the borrower puts just the handle of a sickle as security against the loan money. What happens? The handle of the sickle was lost. The thousand zuz are lost. Seven. According to Shmuel, <clears throat> security is taken as a means of collecting the entire debt, regardless of the value of the security. Consequently, Shmuel holds that the lender accepts responsibility for it as though it was worth the full amount of the loan. See 81b, note 22. Hence, even where the security is worth less than the loan, if the lender loses the security, he loses the entire loan. That was seven. Okay, so thus. thus, thus, we can explain Rabbi Akiva, who rules that a lender who loses security loses his money, agrees with Shmuel's law, whereas Rabbi Elazar rules the lender does not lose the money, disagrees with the law. Eight. In Rev. Eliezer's view, if the security is worth less than the loan, it is taken merely for the purpose of recording the loan. 
definition of Eliezer accepts that a security is taken for the purpose of collection only, where the security is worth at least as much as the loan. Tosafos raises the following difficulty with Rashi's explanation. If, as Rashi maintains, Rev. Eliezer agrees that a security worth as much as the loan is taken for the purposes of collection, why does the Gemara not reconcile our Mishnah with Rev. Eliezer's view by asserting that our Mishnah refers to a security worth as much as the loan? The Gemara above, however, conclude that our Mishnah cannot be reconciled with it with uh, Rev. Eliezer. See Rashba cited by so on. The Gemara rejects the explanation and proposes a new one here. Even low shana masker and shiru zuze. So, if security is an equal to the sum of money that was lent, the kule alma late lehu the shmuel. All agree that they do not accept the law of shmuel nine. Shmuel rules that even when the security is worth less than the loan. If the lender loses the security, he loses the entire loan. The Gemara now contends that neither Rev. Eliezer nor Kiva accepts this position, for the Gemara does not consider it reasonable. Rashba cited by so on. Rather, according to Rev. Eliezer, the loss of this security does not affect a lender's claim at all, while according to Rev. Kiva, the loss of such a security reduces the claim by the value of the security, but does not eliminate the claim entirely. Here the case is the security is equal in value, some money that was lent, the Kamifuge Bidrav Yitzhak. And they're arguing over Rav Yitzhak's law, Dama Rav Yitzhak. What did Yitzhak say? Minai Laval Chova Shakona Mishkon. But where is it right that a creditor requires a security? Ten, Ten. last note, Neil. That is, although he must return the security if the borrower repays the debt, the lender is deemed to be the equal owner of the security in the interim. Okay. Need a new person for notes. Okay. Shinamaru Lachati Yetzaka. It's stated, and for you it shall be deemed a charitable act. Number I think it's 11. me. Oh, Ali, I think you're up. Yeah. You're up, I think. Um, 11. The words cited appear in reference to the creditor of a poor person who has been given the debtor's night clothes as security for a loan, according to Deuteronomy 24, verse 13. The verse enjoins the creditor. You shall surely return the collateral to him at sunset, and he shall sleep in his garment, and he will bless you. And for you, it shall be deemed a charitable act before Hashem, our God. Okay. Now, if the creditor doesn't acquire the security, why would then the Torah deem his returning it a charitable act? Those say, well. The term idka, a charitable act, is used to characterize a person's decision to give up something of his own for another person's benefit. Hence, if the creditor is not considered to own the security that he holds, why should it be considered tzedakha, a charitable act? that he returns it to the debtor. That's 12. Okay. Mikan the Valchov Shakona Mashkin. From here, it's derived that a creditor requires the security. According to Rabbi Isaac, the lender assumes temporary ownership of security. Thus, if the security is lost, it's the lender who must sustain the loss. According to Rav Yitzchak, taking a security is a form of collection pending the repayment of the debt, and the lender thus assumes temporary ownership of the security. If the lender loses the security, even due to an unavoidable mishap, he suffers the loss and can no longer collect the debt because he had already accepted the security as payment for his debt from Rashi. Okay, that was 13. 
Rabbi Kiva, who rules, lender who is, loses security, loses money, agrees with the law of Rabbi Yitzhak, 14. According to this approach, Rabbi Kiva maintains that if the security is worth more than the loan, the lender loses only the amount of the loan. I'm sorry, and maintains that if the security is worth more than the loan, the lender loses only the amount of the loan and need not pay the balance to the borrower. This accords with Rev Akiva's words, if the security is lost, your money, that is the money you loan to me, is lost. The Rishonim raised the following difficulty with Rashi's ex explanation of Rev Yitzchak's ruling. From the Gemara above, it is evident that our Mishnah reflects the view of Rav Akiva, but the Gemara is now, Gemara is now suggesting that Rav Akiva agrees with Rav Yitzchak. If, as Rashi asserts, it is Rav Yitzchak's opinion that a lender is liable even for unavoidable mishaps, his view is incompatible with our Mishnah, which states that a lender is a paid shomer whose liability does not exceed to unavoidable mishaps. See also the answer to this difficulty given by Rosh to Kedishum 8b. These Rishonim disagree with Rashi and maintain that even according to Rev Yitzchak, a lender is only a paid Shomer in regard to the security. <laughs> I find that, that funny that it says that the Rishonim disagree with Rashi, whereas it should read that Rashi disagrees with the Rishonim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he came 500 years later. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, but in time different. <laughs> While Rav Alazar rules the lender does not lose his money, disagrees with his law. Uh, the Gemara rejects the explanation. Okay, it says the Tisbara. Is it reasonable? Imurav Yat Yitzhak. You say Yitzhak said this. He just gonna shalom bishat halvato. Where the lender took the security at a time other than when he made the loan, he took it after he attempted to collect payment. Rav Yitzchak <laughs> derived his law from Deuteronomy 24, verse 13. The Gemara below, 113a, explains that passage as referring specifically to a security that is exacted from a borrower by a court order. Such a security is not taken at the time of the loan and is certainly intended as a form of payment, according to Rashi. Okay, to wrap up here today. Aval Mishkino Bishat Havato Miyamar. He did not say that where the lender took the security at the time he made the loan. And all of them, Rav Akiva, however, referred to security that was taken at the time of the loan. This case. As stated in the Gemara above, 81b and 80 to 82a, and when the security is taken at the time of the loan, even Rav Yitzka would agree that the lender does not assume ownership of the security. We should probably stop here. Yeah, seems like it a good place. Like, it's only it another like I, mean, I, I agree we should stop. It's only a, another half page to the, to the next mission. So yeah, well, it's, uh, I think you guys could finish. I won't be here next week, but I think. You can finish the book next week. There's only a few more pages left, actually. So whatever you want to do as far as... Marty, are you able to lead it next week? Yeah, sure. Okay, if you finish the book, then that'll be good. Okay. okay. All right. See you next week, troops. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. Take yeah. care now. Have a good week. Have a good week, everyone. See you, guys. Okay, we'll start in five minutes, I guess. Okay.
I'll tell you, it meant so much for you guys to be with me on Friday at the uh, at the party. A couple oh, of Friday. Friday, Saturday, Monday. Huh. It's wonderful. You know what? I mean, healthy enough to have a birthday. You know, my dear friend Sharona died this weekend, so I'm gonna be the. the, the I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna have a couple of. Do a couple of her songs on Friday night at the service. Did I know her? Did I meet her? I'm not sure. She was our cantor years ago at the High Holidays. I think I met her. <clears throat> yeah, you might have met her. How old was she? 68. It's that age like Fran, Karen Gambolotti, now her. So... That's three, 68 years old in one year already. So, Well, you know how I feel about the number three. Yeah, well, I know. I know, so we'll dedicate the study here. We'll dedicate the study tonight and to her. I, I'm just glad I was involved with her getting that album out because uh, that album, Always Be With Me, Judaic Love Songs, it's just, it's we do our In Kelohenu every week from there. and. Uh, you know, a couple of her other songs I'll do this weekend that I, I like that are nice. Yeah, four years, lung cancer. Hey, Trudy. Hi. I get I'm to see here. your husband. I get to see your husband tomorrow. Everything's working now with your uh, computer. Can you hear? If you can hear me, it's working. <laughs> it's working. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, thank you guys for coming last Friday to my. I really our was pleasure. So great. It was our pleasure. And then I get to see Steve tomorrow on a Wednesday. Yeah, I can't and then, believe it's Wednesday already tomorrow. Tomorrow, and then Thursday you got the women's group. So whoever's uh -huh. going there. Marcy, uh, yes. everybody um, respond um, responded. Yeah, I'm. I was hoping it was more seven fifteen, like the men, because I don't get out till six. But I can try to race down. See, I get out at six o'clock, and I'm not gonna go home and then come back out again. It's just not gonna happen. Right. Gotcha. I know. I'll be. We're usually there. Again. We're yeah. usually there for a while. So. Oh yeah, we'll oh, be okay. there. You oh, won't yeah. miss much. <laughs> we were there till nine thirty last time. Yeah. Wow. It, it it closes at nine technically though yeah okay good to know yeah I think it closes at nine the restaurant but the bars open uh to like eleven out of all the restaurants I really enjoyed that one me too okay so um this week is a is a monumental Shabbat for me it's uh it's the 55th anniversary of my bar mitzvah portion. Whoa. This week? 55-year anniversary. Wow. Wow. Five. Mazel tov. Well, you know I'll never reach 55 years from my bar mitzvah. Well, yours is another matter. But <laughs> but anyway, um, so I love the Torah portion. It has the last part of the Shema, which I love to sing. It has the incident of the spies 
for which we're still paying the price these days, it seems. So uh, it's, uh, it's an important por portion. And I'd like to go to what the Zohar has uh, to say on the Torah portion. Uh, so it says that they came to the river of Eshkol in the Torah portion. So the uh, in the 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 the, hey, I mean, the Kabbalist Rabbi Judah opened the discourse with the verse. He says, "I'm going to quote Isaiah again, like we did earlier." Thus says the Almighty God, "He that created the heavens and stretched them." So in Isaiah forty two five. It says God created the heavens, and what did God do with the heavens? He had to stretch them. So how much people need to observe the activities of God? Mm -hmm. So when we look at this, what do we mean by that? How much need is there to inquire in matters of Torah for everyone that studies Torah? So when we all study Torah tonight, it's as if we're bringing, we read in the Torah about all the sacrifices. When we study together it's as if we're bringing all those sacrifices in the world of god we're bringing that whole sacrifice world to god so because we're just studying and whatever we're studying it's as if we're doing what was done in the times of the temple but not only that not only are we able to get credit for that but god also wipes away um iniquities and prepares thrones for people in the world to come. So it I, I know people realize how important the study is, but um, you can earn yourself points, the sort of like bonus points for the world to come. And you can find a way to atone for all your sins just by, by studying for God, according to Rabbi Judah. So that's that's a wonderful thing to know, isn't it? Just by studying tonight. And, and not sitting home and playing Mahjong, but actually you can do that later, but taking the time to study with us. So it says that this Rabbi Judah was walking along the way with Rabbi Abba, with another rabbi in those days. He said, I want to wish to ask you one thing. He says, since God is aware that Adam was going, this is a wonderful question. He says, God was aware God knows everything. If God's aware that Adam was going to commit the sin in God's presence and that he would sentence him to death, question is, why, why did God create Adam if he knew that Adam was going to sin like this and cause death to come to the world? Didn't the, didn't, didn't the Torah exist? Didn't the Torah exist prior to the creation of the world? Because it says... When a man dies in a tent, in this week's portion, if a man died, such and such lived and died. What did God want man from? What did, we, what did God want of us in this world? Even if you study Torah day and night, doesn't matter. Everyone has a, a end date, as they say, right? And, and if he doesn't study Torah. So question is, if you study Torah day and night, you still live up to maybe 120 years but what if you don't study torah well at the end is we're still gonna have an ex expiration date right uh so this this applies to all in this world except someone who doesn't so this is this is the wonderful thing about studying torah with you guys but except that one who doesn't study torah even though you know that we're all gonna die they get removed from the world to come, according to Rabbi Judah. It says, as is the good, so is the sinner. In Ecclesiastes, he says that everyone's oh, going to die, but those who study Torah are going to get a place in the world to come. Dan, do you, are you glad that you're part of our group studying Torah if you believe this? that you may not had, get a place in the world to come, but by studying as a group with us, you're gonna, do you feel good about the fact that you're gonna get a, a place in the world to come? Does that give you comfort in, in studying so much of your time with three kids trying to raise them and, and finding the time to study Torah? I mean, I think, I, I think it does, but to be honest, I don't think that I give it that much thought 
when I think about coming to these classes and to services and studying, most of the time I think of how it's going to benefit me in, in this life and maybe not in, you know, the day that it happens or the very next day, but I know it's somewhere down the line, it's going to, it's going to snap and it's going to make sense. And I'm going to remember something that Marcy said, or that you Rabbi said, or Arlene said, and, um, that's usually what my thoughts are not on actually the world to come. It's more immediate. So I don't well, know if that's just me being naive too, or. Well, I, I like your statement because when we study, we study for the sake of study, right? We say Lishma, we study Torah Lishma. We study Torah for the sake of studying Torah together. We had Agatha, we had Talmud, we have Kabbalah. We're studying it just for the sake, as you say, for studying it to trying to better our lives and doing it without a reward. But I'm just saying, according to the Zohar, in this week's portion, there's also a component where you go, you can get a uh, place in the world to come from the study of Torah. Arlene, does that sit well with you or is that a uh, problematic? Um, it's, it's problematic in that I don't think, in my mind, just because you study Torah, you should get a place in, in the world to come. It, it's all about your intention. So if your intention is, I'm going to study as much as I can so I can get a better place <laughs> in the next world. You're not supposed to. That, you yeah. probably don't deserve to be, deserve it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know because I don't set the rules. But if you're studying it because you want to be a better Jew, you want to be a better person, then I think, yes, it makes it makes sense. So if if that's the component, Rabbi, when you receive last rites, what is the purpose of receiving the last Jewish rites? It's because then it's, a, it's like a final confession. So you can confess to all your sins before you die with someone. If you can't do it yourself, there's someone to help you. Say the yeah. Shema and, and say, I am part of the final rites is, is, is asking forgiveness for all the sins that you might have committed. So if you do that, that doesn't, um, that doesn't the, help. Well, that's <laughs> problematic. That, that's problematic too. You can be a horrible person your whole life and you just say those words before you die and you're going to say, well, all's going to be forgiven. Well, we well, don't know for sure if that's the case, but at least there's something available to us to, to say that, yeah, we might have done a terrible thing, but before we come being judged before God, at least we have an opportunity to say one last time, okay, I had a chance to repent and I'm doing it and the last at the at the last minute. Right. Yeah. I, I don't um I, I didn't I didn't mean to to, to imply that just because you get the last rights, everything's fine. But no in in res with respect to what we're talking about, studying as a if, 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 with the right uh in the right frame of mind, help helping to get you to heaven or to the next world. I, I wondered how last rites played into played into that. Um, well, I think I think I, I did it with Fran. Yeah, I didn't do it with Karen because Karen didn't tell me she was sick and I wasn't around. Right. Yeah. Someone did it for Sharona. I know that. Uh, yeah, her, her rabbi did that. Um, I I just think that all these things. You know what? I don't think about it either when I study Torah every day a little bit. I don't, I don't study. I don't think about it. I just, I get a high from studying. Tell you the truth. I have some good rabbis. I study them with them and I feel, I feel like I'm growing. I love it. Uh, I'm not saying, oh, I'm studying. So I'm getting a, a crown in the world yeah. to come. Yeah. And I'm saying, yeah, I'm growing as a person. And it makes it probably easier. I think it probably makes it easier when you have to ascend to another level that you're sort of matching the energy of uh, of come somewhat coming closer to God by studying the ways of God. What do you think, Arlene, about that? By sort of having more of a connection to God, by sort of studying the ways of God and going into the kingdom of God. You think that helps, Arlene? Yeah, uh, I think so. Trying to get think, into the energy of God or the angels I, and God. I, I think if you're if you're, I, I don't know what the criteria are for ascending to, you know, upper levels. But I would think if you have studied and you've tried to learn that it would be it would be easier. 
but I don't think you just get it because you study. Mm. Well, Trudy, what do you think about it? Do you think that you've been studying your, all, most of your life? Does it help you feel good as a person? Does it? Are you, do you feel uh, good when you have to make an ascension uh, to heaven? That you're sort of more prepared, your soul is more prepared I, by studying and going to services and and being in the way of connecting to God on this earth, which might make it easier to connect to God in the next level. I, for me personally, it's it's to be honest, it's a small part because I feel like it's my actions and what I do right. that count the most. Uh, and I that's mean, true. I know. So I know people who, you know, maybe I, in the past, you know, members of synagogues that could spout out all kinds of laws and all that, but their intentions and their actions weren't kind. So I think for me, the way I am, is it's what I do every day. It's the deeds in my life that are the most important to me. Not that I'm a perfect person, far from it. But if I feel like I've made a difference or I've tried to make a difference, that's what brings me closer uh, to Hashem personally. Right. I like that because you can't do anything. When you get to the next level, you can't really do anything physical. The physical part is all here can't do it over there so yeah so the physical aspect of what you're doing here is is important because that's the way um you uh, are so, going to, to so get I to, know, a, like, to a higher level so i know that you know of course studying torah is important but if i'm studying like research to help the children People. I'm working with, does that, oh, does yeah. that count as much or not yeah. as much? No, no, that, that helps also. The fact that you're helping people is what it's all about, the Torah. The fact that you're using your talents uh, to help other people is a, is a great part of life. You, the, if you can help people, God really smiles upon that. In my, in my view, if you're using your talents to make a difference in the world and helping people, like I know some people that some of my friends have counseled, they would have killed themselves. They didn't, you saved their lives, right? Right. You know, there's a lot of suicide, Trudy, among teenagers. You've counseled I, people. You don't have to You've tell me, them. I, yeah. I yeah. deal yeah. with yeah. it. Yeah, I know. But, and it's, there's, yeah. And there's just, a, there's a lot of mental illness period. Um, but I, like to me, you know, I. I feel it's your actions, you know, you know, like words don't mean you can say words, but unless you put them into action, you know, and children know this, like, yeah, it's not what you say, it's what you do. They, they genuinely know that it's as adults that we kind of lose that, I think. But you can, yeah, you can talk all you want, talk the talk, but you've got to walk the walk. Exactly. <laughs> God, God wants those people who are doers. You can think all you want about doing something, but we're in a world of ma'aseh, as they say. We're a world of action that God put us in. So it's what we actually do. You can think all you want, Trudy, about, I want to help this, I want to help that. You could be thinking for three weeks. Don't do any good, does it? No. You could think about three weeks about, I want to give charity. I wish I could. I wish I could. Until you put the money in that pushka and help someone, you know, I don't think you're getting a reward. You can think all you want about uh, worldly things and heavenly things. But unless you do, it's a world of mass, I think, a world of action. It's what you do that matters. As you say, Trudy, you're helping, you're helping people, uh, teenagers and kids and you know, you're saving their lives in a way. I think that's the, one of the greatest things. I come from a family of therapists and uh, my mother, my sister, my ex-wife, my sister-in-law. Anyway, it's uh, it's a whole bunch of uh, careers uh, helping people. And I think there's definitely a lot to be said for helping professions. But I could say that about 
any profession. I mean, if you That's think about true. Enoch, if you think about Enoch, he was ascended to heaven as a human, and and he was taken away as a human. And what was he doing? He was a sandler. Okay, he made sandals, but he was in every stitch that he did. He was still trying to unify the names of God. I'm named after that. That's the name, Hanok. Anyway, that oh, name, nice. Enoch. Enoch became Enoch. an angel in heaven. Yeah, Enoch. Right. Just just thinking about things, but it's, sometimes you you're not in the position like he was. How are you going to be helping people making sandals back then? But um, anyway, yeah, it's it was good for people that needed to walk. But he had this way of unifying God's name in his actions, and that's why a lot of people on the high level like to to, to unify God's names and do all types of concoctions like that with with uh what Abu Lafia did, the great sage uh, mystic. That you know, for four hours a day was just going over the alphabet. A bo, a be, a be, a go, a gay. You know, just merging every letter uh, and every vowel together to form all the all the different permutations of God's name. And it's not for everyone that thing, but I have a friend that does it every day, three hours a day. He just spends doing it. Wow. The rabbi in London. He 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 likes doing that. Anyway, it's not for everyone, but. I, I just think that, as you said before, the intention too. If you don't have the right intention, uh, it's not going to be so great for you. You have to have the right uh, intention to do the kavana as Bernie. In memory of Bernie, I was just going over all the people that left us this year. Yeah, Bernie, you know what? If you don't have the right kavana, if you don't have the right intention, uh, it's not going to uh, help that much. I mean, you could you could be doing things for... Right reasons, wrong reasons, but God, believe me, God can read everyone's mind and God knows what every intention is. Uh, but I got to I got to ask you, um, Scott, when you began to study, do you feel like a certain buzzer? Do you feel like that buzz that I get about studying? I mean, when I'm in the car and I'm listening to some lecture, my rabbi's lecture that was late at night on a Sunday, I couldn't go to. I'm, I'm listening to something about King King Saul and uh, and David and something I didn't know. Do you get a buzz about Scott about something new that you didn't know that all of a sudden, wow, that's a, that's a that's a beautiful insight. I do. That's uh, like being. I think, I think they call it the flow zone. You're being. In, you're in the flow zone and you're digesting things, and my friend. it just it's easy and it makes sense. But it's always nice to go back over something with a new perspective and learn something new. I, I know the thing is, I, I gotta tell you, after being here 28 years, I figured to myself, guys, I said, if I'm gonna stay here more than two, three years, what am I gonna talk about? Sharon knows me a long time. I said, if I'm gonna be here a long time, I'm gonna run out, I'm gonna run about that running out of things to say. After all, I have to give a, a Shabbos talk, Friday night, every Saturday, you know, some classes and stuff. Well, what am I going to say after 10 years? I mean, do I... <laughs> what am I going to talk about? Am I going to talk about something that makes sense? Arlene was quoting me the other day. Uh, so anyway, uh, how am I going to make a statement that might move people? Uh, so it's not easy to do, but I, I seem to find a way to do it. I mean, you know, I just figured, you know, growing up, uh, Rabbis kept my rabbis kept repeating themselves a lot. When I grew up, they had the same message mostly, and they. I, I what I didn't like about growing up is that rabbis spoke for an hour. They used the same message, and they did it like three different ways, so you'd understand it. But I, what do you guys think? I think an hour, forty-five minutes to an hour, is a little bit long for most people to sit through. And uh, when I was in rabbinical school, I remember Rabbi G told me, says, you know what? Try to keep it to 10 minutes because that's about as long as try to get everything into 10 minutes. And lately I feel that the 10 minutes isn't enough. So what I do is I throw in a little humor lately, if you notice. So I'm going back. I'm going back to uh, <laughs> going back to the way I was like years ago. I remember Zach Rinfeld was like doing a service for me. And uh, he was like, I was watching him. and He says, OK, this is the rabbi's joke of the week. <laughs> This is like maybe 12, 13 years ago when he was bar mitzvah. <laughs> now he's living in uh, Dublin, Ireland. But <laughs> but anyway, I, do you guys think that humor is a good way 
is it, is it a good icebreaker? Am I wasting my time, guys, with the humor? You think it's a good icebreaker? No. I, I first got it from Chabad rabbis before lectures, watching them tell jokes that were corny. <laughs> I, think it's I like your corny jokes. I'm sorry, excuse me, but I, yeah. I think it's good. I think it is too. And, and yeah. corny is funny. All you're really trying to do is get a smile and a laugh, right? Yeah, yeah. Some people use humor as a distraction because they're very, very sad. But I don't think right. you do that. I think you use humor to keep people motivated. And, and you're just a really good speaker. Mm, thanks. I'm telling you, when I grew up, the rabbis had no sense of humor. I never heard one joke for 30 years. I, I, I'm serious. When I grew up, there wasn't, it was like, oh, okay, off, it's it's foreboding. It's like, you can't have a rabbi with a sense of humor. It's, uh, it's, it's not, it's not right. You got these scholars, the head of a philosophy department at Yeshiva University. Was he going to tell a joke before speaking? But I, uh, I liked it a lot better when I did have rabbis that told jokes. Um, and you know what? In, Ber in Bernie's memory, oh, bye, Arlene. Bye. -bye. See you Thursday. Uh, yes. In, in Bernie's uh, in memory, I still tell jokes at these classes. I mean, he some classes he went to. Uh, I asked the rabbi, I "says Can I tell a joke in Bernie's memory?" And he goes, "Yeah." So I, I still I keep it alive. Yeah, I keep it alive still. Uh, the joke telling uh, in Bernie's memory because he's the one that. Though, though Bernie was telling the same jokes he told me when I was 20, uh, 28, 20. Wait, how old was I when I started here? <laughs> when I was like 41, 42 years old. But uh, I don't know. I, I just uh, I just think some jokes are, are timeless. But I hope I'm, I'm not being disrespectful because a lot of my colleagues don't do it. But <laughs> I think it's worth a shot. What do you think, Scott? Is it worth a shot? Uh, yeah. What's you you have to find... Happen? You have to find a way of keeping things lighthearted. Yeah. You know, everybody perfect. spends the rest of the week out in the world that we're living in now getting downtrodden and having a hard time. And, you know, they need that relief. You know, I was all set in the Hebrew high school next year to teach a class. They asked me to teach again next year. They liked my Jewish rock and roll this year, um, which was really <laughs> cool. Um, they wanted me to teach it. I was going to teach a class on ethics from Harry Potter. As a matter of fact, I found a friend of mine who actually did it years ago in Bridgeport area. And, 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 and one of the parents says to me, says, Rabbi, if you're teaching a class next year, it should be on Jewish humor. He said, I said, why? He says, because the kids in high school that you're dealing with, these kids, it's in school, it's like so serious and it's so intense, everything. They just need a way to, what do you think? He says, he said, these kids really, need a way to sit back and laugh. Mm -hmm. I think what it puts people in the right spirit to be, yeah. to, to have a message, right? Some people, I remember growing up, there were some people who used to go to a service and they'd be like, oh, I got to do this. All right. We're just going to make it through the hour, the 90 minutes that it is. Yeah. But yeah. by throwing in a joke, you kind of whip them out of that sort of mental state of humdrum into something they can enjoy and it usually sets a better mood for them to be able to accept the message that's about to come so yeah the only criticism i got about a joke is i used the name of one of our members the last name and they said people might think it's that person so if you'll <laughs> if you'll if you'll notice i never use the last name of a member of ours <laughs> <laughs> If I do, correct me, but they, uh, I'm not supposed to be using the name of uh, a, a last name of a member because people might think it's that member. I, not that I would ever do that to someone, but I, I, I got to tell you one thing, Sharon. I was in Brooklyn College. I'm, I, I, this is going back to 19, 1974. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is like so many years ago. It's, uh, it's like uh, 49 years ago. I'm taking a class. I, I registered Z to A. Uh, in, pub, in, in City University. So I, I got a class called Public Speaking. And it was by a Jew from Brooklyn, Charles Toby. I'll never forget his name. So I'm in the class there and I'm speaking and he says, good job. But he says one thing, Ken. He says one thing. People are always going to know where you're from. He says, wherever you go, you'll never be able to shed that accent. 
people always know that you're from New York and that you were born in Brooklyn and you went to Brooklyn College, you lived in Queens. I, I mean, what do you think, Scott? I've been trying for a long time. I don't think I... I don't think I sound like I'm from Queens. <laughs> you may have been able to change your hands, but I no. don't think you'll ever change your accent. Mm -mm. <laughs> I, just, I, think you're I don't there, know right? if it's from Queens or wherever, but it's New York. It's definitely New York. They both have New York. Oh, is that Steve? <laughs> it is Steve. What were you saying? Those women both sound like they're from New York for sure. <laughs> Listen, I'm I'm proud, Steve. I'm proud I'm from New York. I, I I have no, I don't live there now, but I'm proud that I'm from there. I had a great upbringing, and uh, I I I think that when people like my brother that live there still they speak, I think it's like, eh, it's hard to handle. It's so it's such a, a such a real New York. I mean, I feel after living in Connecticut, how long am I living here? I'm living here since um, thirty five years. I, I think that I thought I, I thought I sound more like I'm from Connecticut. But. <laughs> <laughs> I think the same thing too, Rabbi, but Scott always reminds me that I dropped my R's. <laughs> oh. So, oh. Rhode Island is stuck on me too. It's only, only a word with an R. Right. <laughs> and I picked up your R's. Oh, thank you. <laughs> them and I, picked them up. I always say soda. Soda, yeah. Is that a soda? Soda. Like my mother, Amanda oh. Emmer. We, we were doing it yesterday Emmer. with the kids. Go get your pajamas oh. from the drawer. A drawer. Drawer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. I was told in that class that there are people out there in the world that can tell you exactly what neighborhood you grew up in. They can tell you from your accent. They'll, they'll tell you exactly where you live, whether Laurel, wow. Town, like Marty, Rockaway, Brooklyn, what section of Brooklyn. I, I'm not that good at it, but I, I usually could tell when someone's from New York. But uh, I mean, I'm proud of it, guys. But I, I just I just think of it as my grandmother. I used to notice I come from tidy, tight and tight. I mean, that's the way she talks. <laughs> tidy, tight and tight Avenue in Brooklyn. I mean, to me, it's like, oh my God, that's really a Brooklyn accent. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I just, I just think that uh, I think humor is a good. I, I think some of my best moments are when I'm telling a joke to people. <laughs> and you know what? People expect it, and and very few people are prepared for a joke. <laughs> when I ask people, can you no, tell me a joke? Either. They're not prepared to, to even say. I mean, when I've been doing it in Bruce, in Bernie's memory, I must have done it five times. You know, the rabbi laughs. It's it's funny. I, I try to make it somewhat funny. <laughs> well, they need a, a refuge from the, the rest of the world. Yeah. yeah. Folks need that, that break from the rest of the world. Like, one, one last thing for tonight. I grew up with rabbis that you couldn't relate to because they were you know, philosophers and, you know, they thought they were way ahead of us, their pay grade, because they were head of departments of universities. And they just didn't relate to kids. So Sharon knows me the longest. When I came here, I said one thing about when we had a big Hebrew school, I said, one thing about me is I want the kids to relate to me. And, you know, I played guitar with a lot of them. I have, I have eight kids that are, have their own bands now over the years, eight kids, eight students of mine have their own bands. Some, some are drummers, some are bass guitar players, some are guitar players. Seven of them went to Berkeley School of Music. So you know, I'm happy that I can <laughs> have fun with these kids. And I'm glad that they just have found a way to, to have music part of their life. As for me, you know, guys, music is a big part of my life. And, uh, but I'm glad that I can instill that also with the kids. And to me, that was an important part. And I think that's why they hired me, guys, to begin with. Sharon knows me the longest, but when I interviewed, it was with kids. They wanted to see how I did teaching kids. So that's that's how they judged me based on how I would relate to them in a Hebrew school setting. And I did tell a joke. I told a joke about the mouse being bar mitzvah. I did tell that joke at Avatahim in April of 1995. So that was the first joke. What's the I did joke? Tell. What's the joke? <laughs> it was it was to the effect of, you know, there was a mouse in the shul and they couldn't get rid of it. So the rabbi said, why don't you bar mitzvah the mouse? So the mouse won't come back. Uh, 
Yeah, it was it was it was that joke. I, I mean, it was an old joke then in '95, <laughs> but I just I just figured I, I got the job, guys. After that one interview, <laughs> the one service where I told the joke, and uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I I try to show people how to sense humor even back in '95 when I was taking a chance going for that job. But I'm so glad I'm here all these years. Sharon knows me the longest. You know, Trudy recently, Marcy a lot longer, Scott and Dan. But I, I, I always made it my business because I, I grew up with rabbis who sort of didn't care for young people because they weren't contributing big money. But I always, the way I always approached synagogue life was I'm going to be just as friendly with people that are, have a, some of these people in the shul have 10 million, 20 million, 30 million dollars. I'll be just as nice to them as people who have zero. So that's something I learned from Shlomo Karlobach in New oh, York, I the way that. I saw him. The way I watched him operate was sort of the role model that I became sort of, I, I followed his example in that. And very few rabbis were like him that did that, but almost everyone else was catering to the, you know, the big donors. Or, you know, I just, I just, that's just, Sharon knows me the longest. I, I, I think I've always been like that, Sharon, to, to people. I don't think I've ever really uh, hobnobbed over to all these super wealthy people over the years at the show. I actually grew up with a rabbi who was at Brothers of Joseph for 28 years, just like you. And I can't remember anything different about him. He never told any jokes. And his sermons, I swear, he kept one piece of paper or two, probably three or four pieces of paper with his sermon because, and I think it was the same sermon every single year at Rosh Hashanah. And half of the, the synagogue would empty out for his sermon. Uh -huh. Not well, many people stayed through it. Really? Well, yeah. I won't even mention his name, but yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, guys. Anyway, it's been a pleasure. I just wanted to, I was going to teach you one other thing tonight, sort of, that uh, there's some things we could study in, in the way of God to try to understand and there's some things that we, we can never really grasp. But, but my goal with these classes is we're going to try to try to reach that goal of trying to understand the best way we can. If you guys have better ways uh, than I have taught to reach God, you, you can let me know. But there are some teachings that are so far. But since I study with some major Kabbalists uh, every week, I'll be glad to share you, especially what we're going to learn this week on Wednesday. But uh, I, my goal is is for everyone to try to find a way to have not only a connection to each other, which we I think we do, uh, right? At, at the party, you guys were all at the uh, dinner last Friday, right? To me, to me, that's the ultimate connection, Scott and Dan, with you being back and Trudy and Steve being there and Sharon and Marcy and me going out with Steve to hear some music and befriending me to a lot of the top, blues uh, guitarists in the, in the country is it's a nice thing. I, I just like the connection uh, with everyone. And to me, that's the major part of a rabbi to me always was connecting. And when I was younger, I just wasn't connected. To, I, I didn't want to be a rabbi when I was younger. I was never connected to any rabbi in particular until I, uh, until I met uh, uh, the head of Breslov in Israel. Uh, and that changed when I was friendly with Rabbi Chaim Kramer. That changed uh, a lot, but you know, before that, I just didn't feel close to any one particular rabbi. What are your classes tomorrow? Do you still have the Wednesday afternoon class? Yeah, we're back. Yes, yeah, Scott and Deanna back. So yeah, Hebrew at two thirty-three, uh, ethics and three thirty is going to be. Um, There's literacy. Going to literacy, yeah. If you can tune in tomorrow. Uh, please do. The week after, I won't be able to do it on Wednesday, at least, because I'll be doing that uh, that concert in uh, Make Music America Day over in East Lyme from nice. like, 2 to 4. So, okay. um, so anyone, everyone, I want to let you know that uh, I, I, I agree with what you guys all said, that you do the Torah Lishma. You do it for the sake of studying Torah. We don't do it for any reward. If the words come along the way, that's nice. But we do it always to do it as God wants us, just, just to do it for the sake that we're doing it. I don't do it as I asked Scott before to get a buzz. I don't do it. I don't necessarily know I'm getting a buzz. I do it because I think it's the right thing to do every day. And I remember people told me years ago, 
You go, Rabbi, you don't have to study four or five hours a day. Why do you do it? I say, I do it because I like doing it. And I think it's good for my soul. I like doing it. I study all the time. And I just, I just think it's good. And I'm sure you guys agree that there's, uh, that there's always so many things out there. And you want to want to know what you can. And you have so many hours a day. But some of the hours a day, I like to spend time trying to find a way to meditate or get close to God in my own way, that is. So I, therefore, I, I have some cool rabbis that I've met over the years that I study with. Now. I have three rabbis right now I study with weekly. So I'm just glad for that. You know, I'm glad you guys have me as a rabbi. I'm, I try to pass on any great things that I got from these other rabbis I study with every week. Yeah. And okay, everyone. Everybody. Thank you. 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 He's still battling. Yeah. So, well, our prayers are, so I feel bad about uh, Arlene's niece, but it was an eight year battle, you know? Well, we pray and hopefully we can uh, help them with their souls, but uh, so ultimately we can't save everyone, right? Uh, we just try to help people. And uh, that's, uh, what I've said before, Trudy, helping people is wonderful. It says that we have to help people that are mourners, those in need, like try to be close to, you know, Arlene over the loss. It's it's important to help mourners to comfort them. That's one of the great things we have that we actually do to help and helps us and it helps our soul to be able to help be there for other people. And I think every one of us, Trudy, is a, a therapist in a way. We all have experience. We all know what to say to people. Uh, we all choose to do it. I know everyone here does. I know everyone is good hearted over here. I know everyone, if they see a situation, they're going to uh, ask for prayers for people and uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have a good year ahead of us this year. Got a lot of good things coming and uh, I hope I'm glad you guys are such a big part of it that we have three classes on Tuesday. Unheard of. When I first told some of my colleagues, the rabbis, they saw in the paper, they go, how do you do three classes in one day? Yeah, we do it somehow. We just do it. We're committed to doing it. We're used to doing it. That's the way we do it right now here. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think it's working out pretty good in, in my opinion. So I know it's a big commitment on your time uh, of doing so many, but I've I just, really gotten accustomed to telling people that I'm not available Tuesday nights. Oh, okay, good. If it's important, you'll make the time for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, guys. Have a great night. Thank Enjoy you. good weather. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Okay, good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.